This morning we're going to be in Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. So Luke 10, 25 to 37, if you want to go ahead and turn there in your Bibles, if you can, if you want to go ahead and use your app and find it, if you're using version events, then it is already there. Another reason to go ahead and use it, you don't have to turn there because it's already there for you. But Luke chapter 10, verses 25 to 37. Now this section contains a story that is very familiar, not just to Christians, but really to Americans and possibly even to the world. However, because of the time difference and the cultural differences, there are things in this story that we tend to miss. And I want to try to help us to have a better understanding of exactly what is going on in this text. So we can have a proper application for it and proper thought about it in light of our lives. Now, as we go through this text, a couple things that we need to keep in mind. First, as we go through this text, we're going to see that this is a conversation between a Jewish lawyer and Jesus, and during this conversation, the topic shifts. There's going to be a shift in the topic at some point from the initial thing that is asked to related, but a secondary thing that is addressed. And so we're going to deal with that, and I'll show it to you when we get there. Also, when it comes to understanding this text, a simple way to help us understand what's going on in this text and the, the thought process behind it is a simple statement of logic. And that is this. If A is true, then B is true. If B is untrue, A is untrue. And so that's the logical statement that will help us understand what's going on in this text and what Jesus is getting at in this story that he tells and in this conversation he has with the Jewish lawyer. Now, before we read the text, let's have a quick word of prayer. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word. Thank you for giving us your word and preserving it so that we can see what it is you want us to see. I ask you, God, to open up our eyes from whatever may be blinding us to what it is you're telling us. Open up our hearts to receive the message that you have for us through your word. And God, I ask you to be please be blessed and glorified by the reading of your holy word. For it is your word given to us. And I pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Beginning in verse 25, Luke continues the story of Jesus' ministry, saying, And behold, a lawyer stood up to put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? He said to him, What is written in the law? How do you read it? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength and with all your mind and your neighbor as yourself. And he said to him, you have answered correctly. Do this, and you will live. But he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? Jesus replied, A man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho, and he fell among robbers who stripped him and beat him and departed, leaving him half dead. Now by chance a priest was going down that road, and when he saw him, he passed by on the other side. So likewise, a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by on the other side. But a Samaritan, as he journeyed, came to where he was, and when he saw him, he had compassion. He went to him and bound up his wounds, pouring on olive oil and wine. Then he set him on his own animal and brought him to an inn and took care of him. And the next day he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper, saying, Take care of him. And whatever more you spend, I will repay you when I come back. Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? He said, the one who showed him mercy. And Jesus said to him, you go and do likewise. Now, here we have an interaction between a Jewish scholar, a lawyer, who's familiar with the law and is going to try to use the law to really get his way to get into his heaven on his own. And in verses 25 to 28, the first thing we see in this interaction 
is the lawyer's initial question and what he's trying to do. What we see is a lawyer thinks that he can earn salvation through good deeds. So how does this work? Verse 25, he asked Jesus, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? In other words, what good deeds do I need to do to get to heaven? This was a popular view. In fact, it's still a popular view. Many people today still hold this view that good boys go to heaven and bad boys go to hell, or if there's no hell, they go to cops. Never mind. (laughs) I will not sing that song. But there is this popular idea that if you do good things, you're going to go to heaven. Anybody remember the movie Good Dogs Go to Heaven? I, I haven't seen it, but I know about it. Well, it's the same idea of people. Many think good deeds equals heaven. Bad deeds equals not heaven. Well, the lawyer was depending upon this. And so he asked Jesus, what good deeds do I need to do to get myself into heaven by my own efforts? Now, Jesus, who is not exactly known for necessarily always giving a straight, direct answer, doesn't give a direct answer here. Instead, in verses 26 to 28, he flips the script on this lawyer and decides, all right, lawyer, you're a lawyer, you know the law, you're depending upon the law, you're coming from the law, so I'm going to play on your turf. And he does something. Jesus said to him, verse 26, what is written in the law? How do you read it? What Scripture say? How do you interpret Scripture? So he doesn't answer the question directly. He answers with a question. But he sets the, the tone, sets the, the, the basis for the reasoning that he's going to give, and that is the law. So verse 27, the lawyer answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. Now here, the lawyer is citing two verses that are, it's a good idea if you want to memorize these, Deuteronomy 6.5 and Leviticus 19.18. You don't have to do that right now, but Deuteronomy 6.5 teaches us basically love God with everything. It's known in Jewish tradition as the Shema. And Leviticus 19.18 is where we have the command to love our neighbor, which is where we get love God, love others. And so he quotes out of Deuteronomy and Leviticus saying, love God, love others. So the basis of his viewpoint is the law. And what's Jesus' answer? Verse 28, you have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. Now, his phrase, do this and you will live, Do not misunderstand this. The lawyer did not misunderstand this, but today many people can easily misunderstand this. Jesus is not telling the lawyer, yes, do these good deeds and you will earn heaven. He is not saying you can work your way into heaven. That is not what he's saying, and the lawyer knew it, as we see from the lawyer's response in verse 29, which we'll get to in a little bit. But he was not telling him to earn salvation. In fact, he was telling him the opposite. He was telling him, you cannot earn salvation. How was he doing this? Because he says, do this and you will live. So how is he telling him you can't earn salvation? Well, he's using a little bit of logic here. The lawyer's coming at it from this standpoint. If I do enough good things, I will be righteous in myself and I will get to heaven. And Jesus is telling him essentially this. You know what? You're not good enough. You can't keep the law. But sure, if you want to try, but you can't do it. It's impossible. In other words, to use the logic, we can see it this way. Jesus is saying, hey, lawyer, if you want to try to keep the whole law, go ahead. But here's how it works, Mr. Lawyer. You're depending upon the law? Well, I have bad news for you. If you fail to love your neighbor, then you have failed to love God. Now, there's a bit of an understanding of the law, and I say the context of the law is important because the lawyer is coming at it from that standpoint. Now, a couple things we need to keep in mind about the law. 
the law, if you read the Old Testament, the law says this. Those who are absolutely perfect go to heaven. That's, we can say, one side of the coin of the law. Those who are absolutely perfect go to heaven. In fact, Psalm 24, 3-4 reiterates this. Who can ascend into heaven? That is, who can get to heaven? Those with clean hands and a pure heart. In other words, those who are absolutely perfect. If you're absolutely perfect, you can go to heaven. The law says that. But here's another thing, the other side of the coin. This is what the lawyer forgot. Yes, the law says if you're absolutely perfect, you go to heaven, but the law also says this, you're not perfect. So, yeah, there goes that idea. You are not perfect. The lawyer forgot that part. In fact, we see this reiterated in Romans 3.20 and 5.20. That the law shows us our own sinfulness. Because of the law, we can see how we have violated God's ways. How we are sinners, depraved in ourselves, unworthy of anything but his wrath and judgment. We can see that in the law. But the lawyer looks at just one side. If I do good deeds, I am absolutely perfect. And Jesus is essentially saying, is saying this, you're not perfect. You never will be on your own. Now, let's use that logical statement I mentioned before, the if A is true, B is true, if B is false, B, A is false. Let's apply this to here to help us understand what Jesus is saying. The lawyer is essentially saying this, I have a good relationship with God. I know God. I know Yahweh. And many today may say that. I have a good, strong relationship with God. My relationship with Him is couldn't be better, couldn't be closer. Well, if we truly know God, then we will love God and love our neighbor. However, if we ever fail to love God or love our neighbor, a.k.a. if we ever sin, do we truly know God as well as we think we do? No, we don't. Because we're not perfect. We do sin. We break God's law every day. There are many times, and quite frequently, we fail to truly love our neighbor. And if we don't love our neighbor, then we don't really love God perfectly, and our relationship with God needs some growing. Which takes me back to the challenge from last week, or hopefully you're spending 30 minutes per day more than you have been in either God's Word, prayer, or both, and doing that every day. But Jesus is telling this lawyer, who thinks he can earn salvation, you can't because you're not good enough. You're a sinner. You have not and cannot keep the law absolutely perfectly. Now, we know that the lawyer understands that Jesus is telling him this. Why? In verse 29, but he, desiring to justify himself, said to Jesus, then who is my neighbor? The lawyer fully appreciates exactly what Jesus said. He knows that Jesus did not tell him, earn salvation. He knows full well that Jesus just told him, you cannot earn salvation. And so what's the lawyer decide to do? What? Me? But, but I'm going to show you I am a righteous person. I am holy. I do have a good relationship with God. I am a good, holy person. I am righteous. And I'm going to show you exactly how righteous I am. He, he was a humble man. So he knew exactly what Jesus was saying. And through verses 29 to 37, where before the lawyer was saying, asking about how can I earn salvation, now the lawyer is trying to justify himself before God and others. And many people today still do that. We try to make ourselves look good in the eyes of those around us or in the eyes of God. We try to find ways of extolling our own virtue, which is exactly what this lawyer was trying to do in his question of, well, who is my neighbor? But by asking who is my neighbor, we not only have him trying to justify himself, we now have a, that shift in the conversation. 
before the conversation was about how do I get to heaven, now the conversation is, am I holy and righteous? And so there's a shift in this conversation because the lawyer latches on to the last part of the law, love your neighbor, and decides to use that as the basis for his own self-righteousness. Now, his question, who is my neighbor, isn't just a general question of, well, who is my neighbor? He's asking this based upon a Jewish tradition that Jesus was fully aware of, that many today may have forgotten, and yet we still sadly practice it. It's the doctrine of the non-neighbor, basically not a neighbor. What is the doctrine of the non-neighbor? Well, Jewish tradition taught that we should love our neighbor. And who was our neighbor? Our people, a.k.a. Jews. Gentiles are not our neighbor, so we don't have to love them. And Samaritans, well, they're definitely not our neighbor, so we don't have to love them. And so what Jews did is they said, we have exceptions to the law that God gave us of love your neighbor. We don't have to really love our neighbor because, well, they're not our neighbor. They're different. They're not part of us. And so when he asks, well, who is my neighbor? He's expecting Jesus or hoping Jesus will say, Jews, but not Gentiles and Samaritans. He's expecting and hoping that answer. But again, Jesus doesn't give him a direct answer. He instead tells him a story, the famous parable of the Good Samaritan. Now, what is this guy doing in this? He's wanting Jesus to affirm this ultimately sinful doctrine of the non-neighbor doctrine. He's wanting Jesus to give him exceptions and, and ways out of loving your neighbor. In order to say, see, I've loved these people, but they don't count. Oh, he wanted Jesus to say, oh yeah, those times that you didn't love your neighbor, yeah, I'm not going to hold that against you because somehow they, that doesn't, they don't count the same. So yeah, you're perfectly holy and righteous because you love these people, although you didn't love them. That's what he's wanting Jesus to do. He's wanting exclusions, excuses to his failure to love. And sadly, although we may not formally as individuals tout the doctrine of non-neighbor in many ways, we do practice it. And it's not something to be proud of. We find ways of excluding people from the law of love your neighbor. We find ways of saying, I don't have to love that person or that person or that person, just these over here and them over there. How are some ways that this manifests today? Well, going from the most extreme to the more subtle, we'll begin with the most extreme. Racism and discrimination whether it's based upon skin color, gender, ideology, culture, economics, whatever. Anytime that we look at somebody else and say, they're of a different race than me, or they're of a different culture than me, so I don't have to treat them the same. They don't speak the same language as me, so I don't have to treat them the same. They're a different gender than me, or they disagree with me, on gender politics, so I don't have to treat them the same. I don't have to show them love because they're different. Or they're just poor people. Or maybe, well, they're the super rich. I don't have to love them. It's discrimination. And it's a form of the non-neighbor doctrine. I don't have to love those people because of whatever reason. God says, love your neighbor, not love a few people. Love your neighbor. A less extreme way, but still more extreme than the most subtle, is snobbery, elitism, or we might put it this way, a holier-than-thou attitude. And we have talked about this just a few weeks ago. You can go back and watch a sermon on it. It's when we look at someone, and we have the sense of we are better than them. Oh, we may not say it. We may just think it. It may just be in our body language. And we may just somehow convey it non-verbally 
that we are better than others. That somehow I am more holy and righteous than those people or that person. Why can't they be as good a Christian as me? I am a good Christian, but you're not. That is a way of saying, I don't really have to treat you with the same love because I'm better than you. And by the way, if you're not sure if you have that attitude, ask someone else. They'll tell you. And truth is, this is something, a snobbery, elitism, holier than thouness. that's something every single one of us struggles with. Because all of us, like this lawyer, want to justify ourselves. Instead of getting on our knees before God and saying, God, forgive me for the sins that I have committed. The more, the more subtle way that this non-neighbor is manifested today is when we ignore the downtrodden, the heartbroken, the hurting, the homeless, the helpless, the poor. When we see them, but then turn a blind eye to them as if they aren't there. I don't have to love that person. Ultimately, all of these attitudes, whether it's discrimination and racism, snobbery, or ignoring the person, come down to pride and an attitude of us versus them. One of the phrases that you might hear often today, my people. My people, our people. Honestly, I find that phrase offensive because every man, woman, and child is made in the image of God. To say my people versus those people, my people versus other people says us versus them. We are somehow different and better than you. We don't have to treat you the same because it's us versus them. And yes, that attitude has been exhibited in churches. I could give you, I have a book in my office that could show you throughout history how Christians have used the Word of God, twisting it, manipulating it, violating it to have the sense of us versus them. Instead of saying, everybody needs to hear the gospel because God made man, all of them, all of us, in his image. It's an us versus them. These are all manifestations of the non-neighbor doctrine. The idea that, well, we don't have to love people who are somehow not part of us. And Jesus calls out this man for that. But he doesn't do it directly. This man's trying to justify himself, and Jesus' answer is, let me tell you a story. And so he tells in verses 30 to 37 the story, the parable, of the Good Samaritan. And I won't retell that story. We all know the story. You just read the story. But I want to go over some of the information in the story. And this story has some cultural things that have been lost over the years and over geography. I want to bring that to a modern-day American culture understanding. So let's just go through this and what's going on. He talks about this road between Jerusalem and and Jericho. In verse 30, he says, Jesus replied, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho. Now, this is a road very familiar to them. This road was a dangerous road to travel. In fact, many people would often take some sort of protection, whether it's weapons or something, with them to defend themselves against would-be dangers, because it was a dangerous road to go along. And so, when Jesus mentions this road, the Jews immediately go, okay, we know which road you're talking about. It's dangerous. And when he says this guy was robbed, injured, beaten, and left dying, that happened many times. That wasn't an uncommon thing. They could relate to that. But then he says, talks about this priest and this Levite. Now, why does he mention those people? 
Because the priest, the one who serves the Lord, teaches the Word of God, that individual is supposed to be a paragon of loving your neighbor and caring for the hurting and the helpless. And a Levite was a temple worker. Again, someone who's supposed to exemplify love God, love others. And what happens? This priest and this Levite, they don't just refuse to help. They go to the other side of the road to completely avoid this man. They put themselves before this dying man. But along comes a Samaritan. And what's this Samaritan do? This Samaritan, and which by the way, culturally, the Samaritans in the Jewish mind, the Samaritans were the villain. They were the bad guy. They were traitors. They were half-breeds. They were despised. Something that we lose today when we talk about Samaritans. But these people were absolutely hated. And Jesus says, this Samaritan, this villain that you detest, he sees this hurting, dying man. He tends to his wounds. He gives him shelter. And by the way, if you do the math, he gives him about three and a half weeks in a hotel. Now, they didn't have the hospitals like we do nowadays. You can say the equivalent would be putting him up in the hospital for three and a half weeks. And the Samaritan pays that bill and says, by the way, if there's any additional cost, I'll pay it too. He made sure this man, who by the way was probably a Jew, and so this Samaritan goes to a Jew who he probably himself doesn't like, and this Jew who probably doesn't like him, and he shows him love, he shows him mercy, he cares for his needs, he does things that puts himself in danger to take care of this dying man. And then Jesus asks the lawyer, which of these three, verse 36, which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell among the robbers? Well, let's put this story in a modern context. Traveling down a road, see a tragic car accident along the highway. Cars mangled up. A pastor drives by, sees the accident, changes lanes, punches the gas, and leaves. A deacon happens to drive by, sees the same accident, and does the same thing. Leaves this car mangled with people in it dying. Well, along comes a drag queen in full getup, wearing his dress that couldn't be any more rainbow than anything. And this drag queen sees the accident, stops his car, gets out of the car, calls 911, gets the person in that car, to the doctor and tells the doctor, take care of his medical bills. I'm paying for it. Make sure he gets the care he needs. Which one of these individuals, the pastor, the deacon, or the drag queen, was a neighbor? Well, this lawyer, he answered... The truth, but left out some important details. He says in verse 37, the one who showed him mercy. I can almost imagine him sheepishly admitting that. Now you notice he doesn't say the Samaritan. He couldn't even say Samaritan. He couldn't even mention the name of the race of this man. He, so he simply said the one. The pride, the arrogance, the self-righteousness of this lawyer who's trying to justify himself doesn't even have the compassion to say the name. He merely says, the one. But then Jesus responds, go and do likewise. 
He tells this Jew, this Samaritan, this detestable person that you cannot stand, that you think is subhuman, that person who is the worst person to ever walk the face of this earth in your mind, go and do what he did. Now, he's not telling the Jew, go and have the same beliefs as the, as the Samaritan. He's not saying, go become a Samaritan. He's saying the love and the compassion that this Samaritan showed, you show the same love and compassion to others. Or to put it in a modern day. Jesus would say, the love and the compassion that drag queen just showed, dear Christians, go and show the same love and compassion to others. He wouldn't say adopt the beliefs and the values and the perceptions of the drag queen, but instead the love and compassion that was showed. As Christians, we should be showing that same love. So, what's Jesus say to the question? The question is, who's my neighbor? And Jesus' answer essentially is this. The question isn't, who's my neighbor? The question is, are you being a neighbor? Are you being a neighbor? It's not, should I love that person or that person? The question is, are you loving people? Are you caring for people? Regardless of who they are, you don't have to agree with them. You don't have to adopt their values, but you have to show them love and compassion. Jesus did that. I've talked before about how Jesus laid down his life for his enemies, and yet we look at other people and say, I can't help you. You're different. Shame on us. Shame on us. We should be a neighbor, even to people that we may not necessarily like. We should be a neighbor. So I want to ask a couple questions. And yes, there will be a challenge at the end of the sermon, as there have been for the last two, part of this mini-series. But I want to ask a question. What would you do if a drag queen walked in those doors on a Sunday morning? In full get-up. Would you go to that drag queen and show them the same love and say, hey, glad you're here, welcome to Cornerstone. Or would you stay away from them, go to the other side of the church and kind of out of the side of your eye, go like, what are they doing here? What would you do if a gay couple walked in those doors wearing a giant rainbow shirt and holding hands? Would you go to them and say, hey, glad you're here. Glad to see you. Welcome to Cornerstone Baptist Church. God loves you. Jesus loves you. Or would you again avoid them? Look down your noses at them and wonder, what are those people doing here? The church where I served in Florida. The deacon's daughter was openly gay. And yes, often came to church with her significant other. What would we do if that was occur occurring where, where the, there was a gay couple in this church? And yes, this gay couple did stop coming to church for a while after I preached out of Romans that homosexuality is a sin. They got mad at me. It was the truth. But when they came back, this was the greeting. Hey, glad to see you. Been missing you. Glad to see you back. Welcome back. When we look at people that we don't like, can we say that we would be a neighbor to them? Or would we be like the priest, the Levite, the pastor, and deacon, and avoid them because we don't like them or because it's not convenient. So let's take the logical statement and apply this. 
the logical statement at the very beginning. If A is true, then B is true. If B is not true, then A is not true. Let's apply that to this so we can understand what Jesus is getting at. This lawyer said, I love God. I want to show you just how much I love God. Well, if you love God, you will love your neighbor. You will be a neighbor. But if you ever fail to be a neighbor, do you really love God? If we fail to show love to our neighbor, then we have failed to love God. That's what Jesus is getting at. If we're going to say, I love Jesus, we ought to live it. How do we live it? By having a growing relationship with him. By having that relationship becoming closer and closer and closer, more intimate. By sharing the good news with others so that they have a chance to respond to the gospel. What is the gospel? That we are sinners under the wrath of God and Jesus humbly came down and shed his blood for his enemies, paying for sin. And on the third day, rose again so that every person who repents and believes is forgiven and saved. That's the gospel. We be a neighbor by sharing that. And we be a neighbor by serving those around us, regardless of who they are, what they look like, where they come from, how they dress, or what their worldview may be. We serve them and show them compassion and love because that's what God did for us who deserve nothing but wrath and judgment. So here's the challenge for each person. And I'm not, as I said, I'm not going to have a challenge for every sermon. Just these three, might have some later, but primarily these three for this mini-series we've been going through called No, Show, Share. Here's the challenge. I challenge every person to find time in your schedule. I'm not going to say how much. I'm going to leave it up to you. But to find time in your schedule to volunteer to help someone else in this community. You may be thinking, I don't really have time. Make time. If you have time to watch a TV show, you have time. If you have time to watch Instagram reels, you have time. If you have time to sleep in one day, you have time. It's about priorities. That which is important to us, we make time for. And I challenge each of us to make time to serve and volunteer to help those in this community. You may be wondering, how, where can I do that? What are some ways I can do that? Well, I'll mention three in particular. One is the Alice Volunteer Services. They have trash and treasure and the food pantry. They're always looking for people to come help. It's right here in downtown Alice. You can go volunteer there. They're always looking for someone. If you want to know more information, we'll be glad to help you with that. Some in our church do help out with them. And we'd, be, we'd love to get you in contact with them. Another way, the Kleberg Pregnancy Center. They have a mobile unit that comes to Alice, and they're always looking for volunteers that they can train and give you the tools and resources to help women in need who are looking for guidance in their pregnancy as an alternative to the murder of that baby that they we simply dub abortion. They're looking for volunteers. They also have, correct me if I'm wrong, a baby boutique here in Alice, right? Looking for volunteers to help out with that. Another way that we can serve the community and show them the love of Jesus Christ. Another one. It's not here in Alice, but it's relatively local. Adult and Teen Challenge down in Kingsville. Some in our church have been... Well, working with them, volunteering down there, going down there, spending time with those guys, writing them letters. Get to know those guys. They need to hear and see the love of Jesus Christ. Maybe none of these really appeal to you. Maybe you have some other idea. Maybe there's another type of, 
of, lack of a better term, social ministry that you'd like to see in this area that you don't think exists right now? Maybe you want to start something here at Cornerstone and say, hey, I'd like to do whatever it is through Cornerstone. Let's talk. But I challenge each of us to make time in our schedules to serve those in our communities. We should be doing it. And we can say all day long as a church we're going to do it, but it's about the individuals in the church doing it. So I challenge each of us to do that. By the way, the other two challenges don't stop. First one is, as a reminder, first one is, think of one person that you can share the gospel with and invite to church each month, and then invite them to church and share the gospel with them, a different person each month. Second one is, spend 30 more minutes each day with God through prayer, scripture, or both. And then this third one, make time to volunteer in this community. If we do those three things, by the way, these three things are know, show, and share. If we do these three things that Jesus has taught us to do, you'd be surprised what God does through it. And I'm not talking about just for Cornerstone. I'm talking about for the community and for his kingdom and for his glory. Are we willing to step up to the plate? Or are we going to remain in the dugout? Or even worse, at home on the couch, criticizing every decision the coach makes. Let's get in the game. Let's pray. Heavenly Father. 